Greetings, dear brethren, and thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for where you're joining us from, and I thank you for making the choice that regardless of perhaps what you've been facing or what you are facing, even as you join in, that you have chosen to study and worship together. What a blessing it is to know that God truly cares for his children and that there's never a time when God is not seeking to give us hope, that there's never a time God's not trying to revive us, that there's never a time when God is not trying to get our attention to himself. And we just thank God that he cares enough for us. As the songwriter says, he cares enough to be near. And we thank him, friends. We thank him. Every opportunity, all seasons of these worships is, are just repeated opportunities that God gives to us to be able to get to know him better and to be in his presence and, and take in the precious blessings, the floodgates of heaven that he opens upon us. And what a, what a privilege to be able to enter into that presence and know that God is longing to make us like himself. We want to thank God once again for allowing us to worship him. And I pray to your friend that God will speak to you in a special way today. And we just want to pause and just thank him because he has not left us without a word. Every day as we, as we come, or rather every opportunity in which we come together and study in this way, we want to be grateful to the Lord. He's never allowed us to go back without a word. In every message, there is an appeal from the courts of heaven. And what a precious blessing that is. Just what, a, what an unspeakable blessing that is, friends, to, to know that we, as we come together and pray and seek the Lord, that we have the heart and the ear of God. And that as he hears us, he's not just somebody who's auditorily just, just, just taking us in, but rather someone who is practically at work to be able to bring about the wondrous blessings, just the choicest blessings that he has in store for us. And so welcome once again, friends, welcome once again. And I pray that you will have a special moment with the Lord today and that he will speak to you at a very, very personal level. Uh, our study that this day is entitled Called of God, Called of God. And I pray that in a renewed way, God's calling upon your life will be spoken afresh. And that regardless of what circumstances you may be in, that you will be able to see the, the precious calling of the Father that's upon your life. It's the very reason and the very purpose for which you exist. Let us pray. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again. It is always a blessing to kneel before you. Always a privilege to bow our heads before you and to know that God truly is interested in us. I thank you, God, for the privilege to be able to come with brothers and sisters. And so it's just such a blessing, Lord, that I'm not in prayer alone. My brothers and sisters are with me. And Father, it's just such a blessing to know that you're seeking to do something special in our midst. Thank you so much. Every promise that you have made is true. Not one is a failure. Not one is a, in vain. That every promise you've made, Lord, is potent and effective. And that as we learn, as you teach us to live by every word that proceeds from your mouth, in it, in doing what God says, we shall find the greatest joys of walking in the perfect will of the Lord. Thank you, Father, for your calling upon all our lives. And we pray, mighty God, that regardless of what your children are facing, may you remind them of the call. May they not be focused on their fear. May they be focused on their call. May their lives always shine bright for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome once again, friends, and uh, thank you if you've just joined us. Our study today is entitled Called of God. 
and again i pray that god will speak to you in a special way about what he has planned and purposed for your life in the bible we find brethren encouraging one another and we find that you had moses encouraging joshua you had Moses who in fact showed up to encourage Jesus on that Mount of Transfiguration in the New Testament. And we have Elijah encouraging Elisha. We have Jesus encouraging the disciples, the disciples encouraging one another. And the Bible gives us these repeated accounts of how God's children constantly were learning to be like God, to be an encourager of the brethren. And it's so precious because God desires that, especially in these times that we're surrounded on, that God would help us climb the hills of encouragement and brightness, that we'd walk away from the waves and the treacherous storms, that we'd climb up the mountaintop experiences with the Lord and be reminded of our call. You see, friends, down at the shoreline, Oftentimes the waves and storms and the ups and downs of, of life can often take us away from, from where God has in fact planned to take us to. Every now and then it's important that we carve for ourselves a pathway to the top. That, that, that we learn to walk the road that Jesus has walked before us. And that we would learn to go up to those mountaintop experiences away, taking our eyes away from, from, from that which surrounds us and learning to fix our eyes on the one who is above us. That he would remind us the very purpose of our existence. So called of God. And, and we want to take a look at how a, a senior minister is encouraging a, a younger minister. We pick up the story in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1 in this short, very short devotion. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. You know, I really like that. That's, that's very precious. That's very, very beautiful. Notice what, notice what Paul really is saying. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 1, Paul is saying, I am an apostle. And what's beautiful about the choice of word used is that the word means sent. The word apostle really means one who is sent. Paul is saying, I am an apostle of Jesus. I am sent of Christ. I have not chosen this. It is he who has chosen me. I have not I am not going forth of myself. I am sent of my heavenly father. It is Jesus who has sent me and I am an apostle. Now notice, the, while that's the calling, the calling is that you're sent. We, 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 we say that, oh, these were the apostles of the Lord. And we don't realize what we're really saying is these are the sent of the Lord. These are the people who were sent by God. And friends, that's just that's just really amazing, because when you look at when you when you look at that word, it doesn't just mean an apostle; it also means an ambassador, a commissioner of Christ. But it's really interesting to note that when Paul is writing these words in Second Timothy, we perhaps may not have realized that Paul is in imprisonment. He is writing from prison near the end of his life. And notice he's calling himself an ambassador, but an ambassador sitting in, in prison. Isn't that, isn't that uh, an, an oddity that, that sitting there, sitting there in, uh, surrounded by prison walls, yet speaking of such an exalted office that the Lord had declared to his son Paul. Friends, that it is just amazing. It is just beautiful because Paul, that is Paul's introduction. I am an ambassador of Christ. I am the one who was sent of Christ. Perhaps there's one beautiful place where this is illustrated. 
And that is found in Matthew chapter 9. And if you'd come there with me, it is that oft quoted passage found in Matthew 9. The one I'd like your attention to be focused upon for a few moments as we take a fresh look at it. We're in Matthew chapter 9 and we read in verse 35, Matthew 9 verse 35. Notice what the Bible says. Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Then the Bible says in verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Jesus sees the multitudes, he's moved with compassion. And the Bible says, because he saw them fainting, he saw that they were weary. He, he saw that they were scattered. He saw that they were like a sheep without a shepherd. This was, this was deeply disturbing for the Lord. The Bible says he's, he's moved with compassion because it really disturbs him at the, at the, at the sight that is, that is right in front of him. We're told that when he sees the multitudes, he's moved with compassion. It's, it's a very physical word. Uh, it's a word that, that means to have the bowels yearn. If you look at the word, um, it's actually where we get the word spleen from. In the, in, in the Greek, the, the, the word is where we get the word, the English word spleen from. And intestine, that, that's the way that that word is described. So Jesus moved very physically, very deeply moved at the sight of these individuals. He saw that they fainted. They were weary. They were, they were, they were, they were tired. They were tired of the, the heavy load, the oppression. You, you had the, the, the oppressive power of the Romans on one hand. You had the religious figures on the other hand trying to manipulate and just uh, take advantage of, of the masses. And... Jesus just saw them scattered abroad. I mean, there was, there was no harmony. That's because they were a sheep without a shepherd. A sheep without a shepherd. Perhaps somebody knows what I'm talking about. Perhaps somebody, even as you hear this, feel faint, oppressed by some weight of burden, care, worry, guilt. Perhaps you feel that I feel like I'm just scattered abroad. The, 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 the word is also translated as, 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 as a quick toss. And, and it's like Jesus says, you know, he sees them, he sees them, you know, scattered abroad. And he says that he sees that it's like, it's like individuals who, who are like a sheep without a shepherd. Now, looking at this, Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 9, verse 37. Thus saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenty, but the laborers are few. The harvest truly is plenteous. It is abundant. It's many. It's large. But the problem is that the laborers are few. Workers are few. There are many, notice this, notice that there are many who want to be masters, but there are laborers who are few. There are many who want to stand in dominion. There are many who want to stand in domination, but there are very few who are willing to be laborers. Friends, I hope you're catching the depth of what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, oh, there are not enough people in the church. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. The church perhaps may be filled with the masses. We have... We have mega churches and the hundreds of thousands of people who come. But Jesus is saying, I'm not impressed by the hundreds of thousands because the reality is the laborers are few. There are very few who are willing to work under a master, the master Jesus Christ. The word laborers also means one who toils. Perhaps you would remember our message, the heavy weights of the Lord wherein we studied the plan and purpose of the Lord was that we would sweat out, we would labor, we would toil with the blessings and the talents, the heavy weights the Lord has blessed us with. But then notice, Jesus goes on to say, now if the laborers are few, he says the solution is verse 38. 
The solution is not that you should go. No, no, no. The solution is pray. Listen to this, friends. Don't miss this. There are very, the, the, the harvest is ready. And the, if you know anything about harvest, the harvest is not going to sit around forever. If you don't harvest it at the right time, the crop will, will droop away, fade away, die away. You have to harvest it at the right time. The harvest is plenty, laborers are few, so what should you do? You should pray. And then Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. You're not the Lord of the harvest. If you want to be part of the experience, you are to be a laborer, not a master. You are not the Lord of the harvest, although many people want to be the Lord of the church. Pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's amazing. That he will send forth laborers. Uh -huh. So if you feel like there is a need, if you feel like the harvest is plenty and the laborers are few, you shouldn't say, I need, I'll go. What you really should do first is that you should pray. We looked the other day and we studied together that even Jesus, before he picked the disciples, he himself prayed. He's not, he's not making something up, friends, because this is indeed what Jesus himself did. That when there were those who were needed to be sent, Jesus himself spent the whole night in prayer before he chose the 12 the next day or ordained them and sent them out. So friends, we want to keep in mind, Jesus is not asking us to do something strange. It is something he himself is in keeping of. As you see the need for laborers, pray to the Lord of the harvest. And then, then this, this impact point, when Jesus says, and the Lord of the harvest, he will send forth, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Friends, what's amazing about that phrase, he will send forth. He will send forth. That, 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 that word, that word to send forth is literally translated as eject. Have you ever seen videos? Have you ever seen videos of pilots as they, the plane is about to crash? They eject themselves. Has anyone seen a pilot eject very smoothly, just very slowly, very softly? Ejection is quick. It's a quick thrust. It's a push. It's a kick out of the, the plane. Friends, that's the essence that the text brings. The Lord of the harvest will send forth. The word is translated uh, as expel. The Lord will expel forth. He will thrust out. He will pluck out. He will send out. He will put out. He will kick out. You see, friends, many of us in the work of the Lord as his calling comes upon us, Paul knows what it means to be sent. Paul says, I'm an apostle. And if today I'm sitting in prison walls, I shouldn't be surprised. I shouldn't be surprised because God, God did not send me to look for the comforts and conveniences of life. I was sent to take the gospel to the world. And if that meant I'd have to end up in prison, then so be it. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. I was sent forth. I was expelled forth. It, sorry, I'm back. Um, I think I had trouble with connection there. Let us go right back in. Let me put up the presentation again. There we go. All right. Let's pray as we continue onwards. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Please speak to us and we pray that your name will be magnified. Please preserve our connections and allow the name of Jesus to be magnified. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, Paul, he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And, and, and Paul, is, Paul is sharing the reality of life. Paul is saying, friends, that I am an apostle. I am sent forth. That's what we just saw in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38, that he will send forth, expel forth, thrust out. And Paul wanted the world to know 
that, hey, I, I shouldn't be expecting anything higher. Uh, God did not send me to look for the comforts and conveniences of the world. I was sent forth. I was put forth into this harsh world. I was thrown into the battlefield. A soldier's not expecting to be gently placed in the battlefield. It's a hard thud as you go out and do the work. Finish the mission that is given. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I was sent, I am sent of Jesus. And then he says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 1, I am sent by the will of God. And I really like that too. I really like that, that, that choice of those words. That number one, I am sent out. And as I'm sent out, I'm not sent out of my own. I'm sent out by the perfect will of God. It is the will of God that sends me. And that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Hence, prison walls. The struggles, the challenges, the persecutions, the beatings, the strife. But guess what? If it is the will of God, then it is the will of God. And if the will of God ends me up in prison, then so be it. Because the promise of life in Jesus is far greater than any promise any worldly empire can make for me. Second Timothy 1 verse 2, Paul continues speaking to Timothy and says to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. You see, he's speaking to someone who he has nurtured in the faith. And although Timothy is not, as we, as we looked at the story of, of, of Philemon and Onesimus and Paul, notice how he called Onesimus his, his own son. Similarly, he's calling Timothy his dearly beloved son, not his biological son, his dearly beloved son, one who he has taught and instructed in, in the ways of the Lord. He says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and, and Christ Jesus our Lord. He continues speaking to him, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Wow, what a great love between these two brothers and fellow ministers of the Lord as they weep for one another and, and remember one another and desire. I'm sorry, I, I seem to be having uh, connection issues today. Um, let us continue with a prayer. Let's just put this up and we'll pray again. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that again, you would please safeguard our connections and allow the name of Jesus to be presented before his people. Thank you so much, for we know you're able. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, we're in 2 Timothy 1, 5, and, and Paul is saying, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, Timothy, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I'm persuaded that in thee also. Paul is speaking of, of Timothy and, and speaking about the rich spiritual heritage that Timothy is coming from. In fact, in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 14, we read, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So he's again an encouragement, you know, continue in the things which you have learned. In fact, he goes on to say that from a child thou has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He's speaking first of the spiritual heritage that uh, Timothy has had. And in that spiritual experience and having that, that, that wonderful, unspeakable blessing of having a home that loves the Lord, he says, hold on to the things that you have learned. Do not let them go. And friend, that's a, that's a reminder to us also. Notice what he, he's saying in verse 14, continue in the things which thou hast learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you've been able to learn these things of. So continue on, continue to grow in these truths and do not let them go, which uh, these are the truths uh, that you have held on, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Beautiful words. So much so, friends, that we find in Acts chapter 16, 
uh, we see, then came he to Derb and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. Notice, Paul, when he hears of him, and he's been given a good report right from the beginning. And as he hears of Timothy, he joins in him with him and he desires to have him go with him on this mission trip. And it's so powerful that they, they, they experience and they develop a bond, a very familial spiritual bond. And there's this deep, deep affinity between the two, how they desire and weep for one another. What a, what a precious, precious blessing. And oftentimes it would have been that Timothy would have been an encouragement to Paul and Paul has been an encouragement to Timothy. But notice, friends, what, what Paul continues to say to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This is interesting. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You see, friends, he's preparing him. He's preparing him for the storms and the struggles that are to come ahead in his life as he seeks to minister to others, as he seeks to follow the holy calling of the Lord. In fact, we read about it in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9. Really powerful words. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9. Paul says, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Oh, what a powerful text, friends. That we were called, not because of ourselves, not according to our works, not because of some ability or some goodness in us, but we were called according to his own purpose. Friends, I hope we realize that we have been called of the Lord, not because of an innate goodness and quality hidden in us, but rather we are called to be a part of the purpose. We are called according to the grand purposes that we cannot put in words. We, we cannot fully fathom the, 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 the deep mysteries and then the far-reaching implications of the Lord. But he still calls us because it serves the purpose, the greater purpose, the grander picture that God has in mind. And Paul says to Timothy, he says, it is Jesus who has saved us and it is Jesus who has given us this holy calling and we are not to forsake it because it's, because it's placed upon us, not because of our works and our goodness. It is placed upon us according to his purpose. Notice what he goes on to say in verse two, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Number one, uh, Paul, he's saying to Timothy that you are to be reminded that as we go out in this work, you are to be strong, son. For you cannot be weak. Be strong in the Lord. Make sure you are constantly growing. That's the, that's, that's the word that he has for him. Make sure you're constantly growing in the truth that, that has been given to you so that hard times don't catch you by surprise. That you are in the strength of the Lord because to somebody who chooses to stand up for the Lord, you will face hard times. You will face treacherous times. These are, these, are, these are important words. Wow. He, he says to him, be strong in the grace. He continues in verse 2 and says, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. He's encouraging Timothy. He says, Timothy, don't keep these truths with yourself, but rather go out and share the good word, share the faithful truths of the Lord. Share them with faithful men who themselves will be able to teach others also. Thou therefore, now counseling this younger minister, and what a, what a powerful, powerful counsel. And friends, one that we really need to pay attention to because we could learn much about the calling of the Lord that is upon all our lives. Notice what he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 3. He says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Deep words, deep words. He says, Thou therefore 
endure hardness. Hmm. You can read further down in chapter 4 of, 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 the, of the same book, 2 Timothy. Chapter 4 and verse 5, Paul says to him, Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. He's saying to Timothy, he says, Timothy, be ready. Be ready. He's not, notice, notice. He's not saying, he's not saying, yeah, you know, sometimes you might, you know, face hard time. No, 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 no. He says, son, endure hardness as if that's going to, that is the norm. That's the kind of understanding he'd like Timothy to have. He says, Timothy, be prepared at all times. It's, it's not going to be an easy life. He says, therefore, endure hardness as you go out to share the good news of Jesus. Be strong in the Lord always, friends. Let not difficult times catch you by surprise, disappoint you, discourage you, and make you think I should quit working for the Lord. Am I speaking to someone, friends? Who feels like, no, it's too difficult. I should quit. I should just quit this faith. I should just walk away. Friends, Paul is saying endure hardness, endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Friends, we are called of the Lord. And those who are called of the Lord are to be prepared. They are to be strong. They are to be strong, strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. We are to endure hardness. We are to endure hardships. For that's what it means to be called by the Lord. Friends, this is really, this is really like, 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 a, this is really like a revelation of what it means to be called by the Lord. It's not a, it's not an invitation uh, to, to, to an all, to an all day spa treatment. No friends, it is a rough battle. And guess what friends, guess what? It's so powerful that if we experience the, the turmoil, uh, the Bible says, you know, the psalmist says we are killed all day long. And perhaps, friends, for standing for the truth, you may perhaps be experiencing the whole ordeal of experiencing what it means to, to, to realize what the psalmist was saying when he says, we are killed all day long. I think Paul, in fact, picks up those same words in Romans chapter 8. For your sake, for standing up for the truth, for standing in righteousness, we are killed all day long. But Lord, that is not going to make us, that is not going to make us leave the faith. You see, friends, uh, to, to many, the devil is testing and trying and seeing what can I do to make this person give up their faith? There's somebody right now who is being tested and tried in their own home so that they just quit and leave and walk away from the Lord. Somebody is beaten and tried by the devil just so that they quit their marriage and walk away. Someone who's being tempted by the Lord to give up on his children and just, 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 just resolve to, you know, just, just discouragement and, and destruction and desolation. Endure hardness to your brothers and sisters as the good soldier of Jesus Christ. Get strong in the Lord. Get strong in the Lord. Hit, hit base camp again. Hit the training grounds of Christian life again. Go back to the Lord, friends. Go back to the Lord. If you're feeling like giving up, go back to the Lord and he will make you strong so that you endure hardness. Number one, as a good soldier. Notice, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. That's powerful. That's powerful. He says, learn that you are to endure hardness. You are to have the focus of a soldier. Why? Because, because a soldier who's going to war cannot get entangled with the affairs of this life. I'm going to come to that in just a bit. It says that he who is called by the Lord 
has no time to get entangled in the affairs of this world. He who is called to the spiritual warfare has no time to get entangled, inter entwined, involved, caught up with the things of this world. Interestingly, friends, this Greek word is only used once in the New Testament. It's only used one other time, and it's found in 2 Peter 2, verse 20. It's a text we've looked at in the past, but one that demands our attention today as well. 2 Peter 2, 20, this is what the Bible says. If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. Over and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Dear brothers and sisters, do not get entangled. Don't go back like a dog to the vomit, to lick back the old sins, to pick up the old man that was buried in the grave. Friends, God is calling us to stand up and to stay up, that you would be, you and I will be able to please Him who has chosen us to be a soldier, not according to our works but according to his purpose. No man who is called to war has the time to get entangled with the world. He doesn't have time to get entangled in the things and the ways of the world. You have no time, friends. You have no business getting entangled in the ways of the world. That's the focus that is required. That's the focus a soldier needs to have. In verse 5, Paul goes on to say, if any man also strive for masteries, yet, he, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The next example he gives him is that he says, he who is striving for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. He then, after giving the example of a soldier, gives the example of an athlete. In fact, the very word that you see, strive for masteries, that word masteries is translated as athleo in the Greek, from where we get the word athlete, to contend, to strive. And so we read, if any man also strive for masteries, if any man is an athlete, Yet he is not crowned, friends, except he strive lawfully. He then gives the example of an, of an athlete who, who is striving, who, 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 is, who is disciplined. There's discipline in the life of a soldier. There's discipline in the life of an athlete. And the thing is, friends, we read in, we read in Hebrews chapter 12, and the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, it says we are to run, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, we are told that, friends, we, sh we wherefore seeing also that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Many years ago when I was in college, we had the, 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 the privilege to be a part of a marathon. And then and, and the marathon took part in this five kilometer marathon. And as we were partaking of that, Gatorade, I think, was one of the sponsors. And, and, and they gave us, or I guess it was the organizers who, who, who gave the runners Gatorade. And, and I remember in that five kilometer, that was many years ago. But I remember there were those who, I guess, perhaps what I saw, who was running and did not want to be brought down by the weight, even of the drink of this energy thing. And I saw him just tossing the the drink and just running. He wanted nothing to beset him, nothing to hold him back. And Hebrews 12 verse 1, we're told, let us run this race with patience, the race that is set before us. Somebody says, but wait, in, why are we in a race? I'm not trying to defeat anyone here. Well, the reality is, friends, we're not racing against each other to get the crown of life. The reality is, friends, we are running against the devil. It is the devil who's trying to catch up. It is the devil who's trying to get ahead of us. It is the devil who's seeking mastery over us. And unless we're running the race with patience, looking only unto Jesus, as Hebrews 12, 2 says, who is the author and finisher of our faith, we will not be able to make it. We will not be able to make it. 
The Bible says, friends, that we are, we are to be disciplined like a soldier. We are to be firmly grounded and training like, a, like an athlete. That is to be our life. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 6 goes on to say, The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Isn't that beautiful? Paul in these passages gives us the three ways of living the Christian life. He says we are to be a soldier, says we are to be an athlete, and says we are to be a husbandman, a farmer. He says, he says, Brother Timothy, you are to endure hardness. It's going to be hard. You need the discipline of an athlete. We, you, you have to strive, brother. Do not get caught up in the ways of the world. You have to strive and train every day. Athletes train every day. Athletes live on a strict health regime. They're on a very, very strong, strict diet. You need to watch out, brother, or the devil will try to destroy you if you're not training with the Lord every day. Brother, be strong in the Lord. And as you go out to teach others, make sure you're also laboring like a husbandman. But you see, one of the things about the husbandman is that the husbandman is the first partaker of the fruits. Brother, you can't give to somebody else what you've not tasted yourself. Are you listening, dear friend? You can't feed someone else what you've not fed upon yourself. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Taste the fruits, friends. You're asking, inviting others to, and, and, and compelling others, encouraging others, inviting others to, to, to be a part of. Let them see the results of the fruit in your own life so that they would desire to eat of the precious fruits of the Lord. Be a soldier, be an athlete be a farmer this is the desire of the lord this is the desire of the lord as he calls as he calls his people to be a part of the work but we notice something friends we notice something that is found in haggai chapter 1 and it's really interesting how this this new testament books take book takes us all the way to the book of Haggai. And we find this, this, this very, very disturbing revelation. It says, Haggai chapter 1 and verse 11. Haggai 1, 11 says, I called for a drought upon the land upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Wait, wait, wait. We're called of the Lord, called to be a soldier, called to be an athlete, called to be a farmer, called to be disciplined. But friends, the Bible says, the Lord was disturbed with his people. For he found that his people, as they returned from captivity, they had neglected the house of the Lord. Notice, friends, notice what the Bible says in, in Haggai chapter 1, and I'd like you to read verse 2 with me. Thus speaketh, Haggai 1 verse 2, the Bible says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house shall be built. It's like, what? They, were, they had returned from captivity. God had released them from captivity. And yet they were not found building the house of the Lord. In verse 3, the Bible says in Haggai 1, 3, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses? And this house lie waste. All right, so the time for the Lord's house to be built has not come. So is it time for you to stay in your own houses? 
is it all right that, that, that God's house is not built, but you're busy building your own house? If it's not time for the Lord's house to be built, then who decides that it's time for your house to be built and, and finished and your sealed houses? Your sealed houses. And while your houses are built, God's house lies waste. Dear friends, do you realize what Paul is saying to Timothy? He's saying, Timothy, we are called of the Lord. Called to be soldiers. Called to be athletes. We're called, Timothy. We're called to be husbandmen. We're called to be farmers. Brother, we're not called to build for ourselves. We're called to build for the Lord. Brother, we can't. We, we, we can't be looking out to build for ourselves while the work of the Lord lies in shambles. The Lord's house lay waste and you're busy building your own? You're listening, friends. In verse 5, the Lord says, Haggai 1, 5, he says, consider your ways and see what you've done. Verse 6, you've sown much, you bring in so little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe, but you're not warm. You earn wages, but where do they go? It's like putting them in a bag with holes. What's happening that you have all of this and you're still not satisfied? You're not at peace. There's no joy in your home. Why? Consider your ways. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. God is saying you're unsuccessful in verse 9. He says, all of this has happened because of my house that is waste, and you run every man unto his own house. The Lord says, dear brothers and sisters, we are barren today because we've left the work of the Lord barren. Brothers and sisters, we're called of God, not not according to our works of his great purpose. And the purpose is God would like us. God would like us to be walking in his perfect will. God would like us to be out there. Sharing in whatever way possible. To be a soldier. To be an athlete. To be a farmer. A hard laborer. friend. What are you doing? Ignoring the work of the Lord still busy trying to secure something for yourself while the work of the Lord lies in waste? Friends, don't misunderstand me. God is not saying don't feed your children. God is not saying, you know, don't, don't care about your family. That's not what God is saying. God is saying, is it, is it possible though that you can get so possessed about caring for the family that you can stop caring about God's work? Is it possible that you can get so worried about a future you've not even seen? And trying to secure for yourself the future, you ignore the present work of the Lord. And, the, and, the, and what the Lord is saying is, friends, that our unsuccessfulness, our lack of progress, our lack of goodness, our lack of of spiritual prosperity, our, the lack of peace and joy and contentment in our homes is directly resultant of the fact that we have forsaken the ways of the Lord. We have left God's house waste while trying to build a house for ourselves. Friends, in fact, the Bible says in verse 10, this is why the heaven over you is stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from your feet. He says, I've held it. I've not allowed it to rain. Do you realize that there's a spiritual implication there? He has withheld the outpouring of his rain, the outpouring of his spirit upon you. And notice, friends, that the God who calls us also has the power to call a drought upon the land. That's verse 11, Haggai 1.11. You see, friends, God had called a drought 
upon the land. It's a really interesting play of words there, friends. A very, very interesting play of words there. In Haggai 1.11, the Lord says, I have called for a drought upon the land. And what's, what's, what's amazing about that word, what's amazing about that word is that you'll find the similar word is used in Haggai 1.4. A similar word is used in Haggai 1.4. When you read, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? And then you read, I have called for a drought. They come, they, those, both those words, waste and drought, come from similar, similar words. In essence, what God is saying is, if you have left my house waste, I have called wasteness upon the land, a drought. Upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the wine, upon the oil, upon which the ground bringeth forth, upon men, upon cattle, upon all the labors of the hand. Dear brothers and sisters, the Bible says when all our energy should be focused on being a part of the Lord's work, we're only experiencing barrenness and a lack of joy. Because friends, we cannot, we cannot, we just cannot ignore the ministry of the Lord and expect to find peace in the barrenness of life. The reality is, friends, outside of him is really barrenness. And, 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 and it's, like, it's like the curse of the Lord is the experience because when we choose to go outside of him, he is the fruit. He is the fruit of the land. He is the rain. When we're outside of him, it's not like he's waiting to destroy us. He's saying life outside of me is a desolate wilderness. And that's why you don't have the peace. That's why you don't have the joy. That's why you don't have the contentment. Because you got entangled. You got distracted. You stopped training. You stopped laboring. You got entangled. You got entangled in the cares of the world. You got too busy with the house. And you took your eyes off of the Lord. You took your eyes off of the Lord. Hmm. You took your eyes off of the Lord. You should have remembered. You should have remembered what you were called. You should remember today, friends, what you are called for. I want to read to you Haggai. I want to read to you Haggai chapter 1 and verse 12. Haggai chapter 1 and verse 12. Notice what the Bible says. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear the Lord. People did fear before the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? He was the prophet the Lord their God had sent him. Just as God is longing to send you. Expel you. Push you forth. Thrust you out into the mission field to be a part of the finishing of the work. Dear brothers and sisters, it is a precious work the Lord has called us to. Are you doing your all to be able to stand? Are you doing all to be a part of the finishing of the work? Are you reminding, are you reminded of the Lord that you are called? You are called. You are sent. You are chosen by the will of God called to do a special work. And yes, perhaps, friends, not all of us, perhaps not all of us are called to be in that same line of, of work. We're not all called to be in the same medium of work, for that's what the Bible tells us. To some he gave teachers, to some he gave apostles, to some prophets, 
Everyone has a work to do, but notice the work of the teacher, the prophet, the doctor, the nurse, the engineer is one. While, the, the, while, these, while these different professions and, and, and work spheres may exist, the calling is one. And that is to win souls for the kingdom of God. The calling has never changed for anybody. The calling is one. So whether at the hospital or whether at, at the construction site as an architect, or whether as an engineer down in, in, in the engineering office, you are to know that the work is one to win souls for the kingdom of God. Your brothers and sisters, I hope you do not forsake the leadings of the Lord. I hope you do not forsake the calling of the Lord. I hope you realize how sacred this is and that life out of God is utter desolation. Let us not think, friends, that we can forsake the Lord and build a life for ourselves because it's impossible. You can't build life out of life. A life out of life is really death. That's what we're building for ourselves. We studied yesterday. Your agreement with hell will not work. The agreement with death will not come through. Safety is only in Jesus. If you're reminded, dear friend, of your calling, Would you like to kneel with me and say, Lord, help me to live and to be sent as a servant of the Lord, according to the will of the Lord. I'm willing to be thrusted out. I'm willing to be expelled forth. Teach me, Lord, what it means to be a soldier, an athlete, a farmer. Teach me not to look for conveniences, but to look for usefulness. If that's your desire. Join me in prayer, friends, if you're able. Let us kneel as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. What a blessing it is. What a blessing it is to be called by you and to be assured that the God who calls us is the God who equips us. That the one who brings the calling is the one who also brings the enablings for every call is an enabling, an enabling from the Lord. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for their desire to live for you. In every heart, Lord, there's some battle, some battle raging somewhere, some deception, some trial, some difficulty, some burden. My humble plea, Lord, fight for your people, please. Please fight for your people. Give them the victories. Give them the discipline. Give them the steadfastness. Give them the training. Give them the laboring. Let them taste the fruits you long for them to bring to the world to taste. Thank you, Father, for your great, matchless, and ever-present love. Thank you, Father. Forgive us for ignoring the house of the Lord while trying to build our own. Cleanse and purify our hearts and build us in thee. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.